Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great evening. Absolutely. It's Wednesday night again, and uh, we just keep coming up with fun stuff to talk about. Tonight, it is vampires and the Ozarks. Maybe not two things people put together very often, but... Uh... So, uh, we'll... <clears throat> uh dig into this whole process it is there's actually a lot of material that we have and and uh, we do encourage people if uh there's an additional information that you have to share please feel free to uh to direct message uh, uh personal message dark ozarks uh as well as if it's something that you feel comfortable sharing uh more publicly uh just write in the comments below exactly uh that's part of this process is is uh building stories building uh a compendium of lore so um, it's your chance to get involved and and boy howdy there is actually a lot of lore uh, associated with all of this and it's it's uh, both uh, historically and uh, and in contemporary settings as well something that uh, can be certainly was surprising to me when we first started digging into this information same here I guess before we uh, really get uh, headlong into the uh, topic, we ought to stop and say uh, shout out to our sponsor, Always Buying Books, who sponsors yes. the uh, video cast as well as the podcast, which uh, you can also catch on uh, Branson Podcast uh, Network. Uh, we are very pleased to um, uh, be affiliated with them just yep. over a week now, and things are going well, and numbers are climbing. So uh, excited about that. Uh, Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri uh, is just, it, it's a phenomenal bookstore. I'm not just saying it because they sponsor us, but uh, uh, I've been a patron for years anyway, and uh, uh, just a great inventory, everything from general reading to um, really hard to find, not very high-end uh, items, and hard to find unusual nonfiction, everything, everything that a book reader can drill over. So <laughs> and Bocanalists do a great job. So they they really do. It's the, the curation process is a huge chunk of the battle. Having, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm always looking through uh, book selections anywhere I am. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of times it's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Where you can you can you can typically tell pretty quickly if uh you know how much of a curation process there is and yeah. uh, their their process is phenomenal uh, there's they have a ton of titles right now that i would love to buy i'm i'm um pacing myself within this process and then uh you know <laughs> in terms of uh, of non-curated sources I, I you know a number of times in other locations see a stack of books and be like oh this looks like it's going to be really good and it's like 1980s um how to cook low fat <laughs> with your microwave and uh those are just depressing to say the least yeah so you know uh, <laughs> zip up your windsuit and uh run not walk to a much better curation of books there you go <laughs> very well put they are on uh, north main street in joplin missouri if you can get in there uh in person that's wonderful if not find them online at their website alwaysbuyingbooks.com as well as on Facebook, Always Buying Books, and their affiliated uh, group, friends who like uh, Always Buying Books. They put a lot of inventory up there. You can buy it. Um, and if you're not local, they can mail it to you, or you can call them and see if they have something that you are looking. Maybe they have what you've been looking for forever. So uh, very, check it very out. Possible. Very possible. So, yeah. Um, great, great sponsor. Love to be affiliated with them. And um, we have events coming up. We have quite a, quite a few events. 
fall is hitting fast and furious. Yes. <laughs> I I have my uh, uh, my my uh, uh, pumpkin pumpkin mug out already. <laughs> no pumpkin spice joke, huh? Uh, fortunately, no. Uh, black yes. and coffee. Not a not a pumpkin I spice. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'll, I'll jump on on one side as opposed to the other of this bandwagon. I'm not a pumpkin spice kind of girl. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so, in um, uh, first off on the uh, the calendar is State of the Ozarks Fest. Dark Ozarks will be there as well as obviously State of the Ozarks at State of the Ozarks Fest, Saturday, September 17th in downtown Hollister, Missouri. Yes, and it's uh, it's gonna be a good event. I mean, it, you know, uh, Josh has a hard time patting himself on the back of uh, doing this, but you know, uh, you put on a wonderful event. I've been there every year, grows yes, every have. year. Um, <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder, you know, when it's going to overflow. Um, <laughs> we'll just we'll just take over more parts of the town. Exactly, um, but it's it's rather unique for a small town festival because of the variety of things that go on. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of entertainment, uh, you know, music, um, uh, trade, you know, uh, artisans. Uh, doing demonstrations, there's uh, Civil War reenactors, there's medieval combat, there's good food, um, and just various things that um, you don't usually see in all in one spot. So, you know, hands off, you do a great job, Josh. Thank you. It's, uh, it really, I, I really enjoy um, curating an event that brings very diverse uh, elements of the Ozarks together in one place. And it's, uh, it really is a, uh, the outcome of my, my day job as editor in chief. I, uh, for stories, I'm always looking for very interesting, uh, unique groups of people doing interesting, unique things. And, but for a variety of reasons, often just in terms of time economy, uh, those groups rarely have the opportunity to interact with one another. True, and and this is an opportunity for that to happen, and it does. Yes, yes, always, always an enormous amount of fun. So, uh, make your plans to see us there. Uh, the State of the Ozarks and Dark Ozarks booths will be combined, I do believe. Uh, will be centrally located on the street in front of the Old English Inn, and which is definitely an iconic landmark um, space. And then uh, we'll have books. Yes, we, we will have books. We've actually both ordered books, which is amazing. We <laughs> it really <laughs> is. <laughs> it really is. I'm very excited about that. For people that don't know, uh, we have books, uh, books yes. that we've written. I mean, we have a lot of books that we haven't written, but we also have books that we have. Exactly. <laughs> so come check them out. And then the following week on the 24th of September, we will be in Caney, Kansas, actually in the little Ozarks of Kansas, it's called, and for the Border Town Paracon, where we'll both be presenting uh, on various topics. And um, uh, it's put on by SEK, Border Town Paranormal, which is uh, a wonderful group, and it's a, it's a really good event I've presented before. Um, and we've worked with them um, and uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, so check it out, it's a free event. Go to the SEK Border Town Paranormal page on Facebook and uh, find out details or um, we'll post again, but we have it on our page as well. Uh, and then we'll be back in Hollister on October 7th. Yes, in conjunction with the uh, State of the Ozarks hosted first Friday Art Walk of October, uh, we will be bringing the uh, the haunted uh, historic walking tour back to Hollister, uh, including a tour of the Old English Inn, which is quite haunted. Yes, and, and it's something that we've done over the years, um, and then we haven't over the last couple of years between 
various things, including a certain, you know, national event that kind of threw things off. But um, yeah. so glad to get back there. Tickets are available at paranormalsciencelab.com. Uh, tickets are, are already selling through. So uh, grab yours so space doesn't uh, run out. Yes. Then, and uh -huh. oh, as I say, it's, uh, it's going to be a great opportunity. Uh, a lot of history, uh, folklore, uh, mm -hmm. storytelling, and um, cosplay. Uh, yeah, it's a neat, neat combination. Excited about, excited about that night. And and uh, you know, we'll be walking by some great art on the sidewalk of exactly. downtown Hollister as well. And then um, the fifteenth, uh, Saturday, the fifteenth of October, we will be in Joplin for Dark Ozarks October Country at the VFW Post 534. Um, yes. And uh, all day event where we cover uh, all kinds of topics uh, from dark history to the paranormal to unexplained uh, mysteries, cryptids, etc. cetera. And uh, the public gets involved as we were not, we're not just being talking heads um, uh, lettering and uh, everyone gets involved it's a fun event when we do these kind of events they're some of my favorite um and there's going to be a lot going on so get your tickets again at paranormalsciencelab.com and uh, we will see you there and we thank always buying butts for sponsoring that event yes we do then <laughs> uh on october 20th uh Dark Ozarks will be back in Joplin for uh, the walking tours. Yes, the uh, old Joplin downtown walking tour, um, which will be in conjunction with Third Thursday Art Walk in Joplin. Um, and we're partnering with uh, Joplin Downtown Alliance for that. Uh, proceeds will help benefit the Alliance, which they do a lot of good work with, uh, supporting the arts, art, local artisans. Uh, as well as playing on the art walk um, and um, being uh, a principal in uh, various projects, restoring historic buildings, et cetera. So they do a lot of good things. So uh, come out and hear uh, some of the dark history and ghost stories of downtown Joplin. Yes. Uh, tickets are on sale at paranormalsciencelab.com. Then and the 29th, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will be back at the Ritchie Mansion and uh, in Newtonia, Missouri, one day after the uh, the anniversary of the Second Battle of Newtonia. Uh, for folks who don't know, the Ritchie Mansion and the city of Newtonia uh, were, were mm, a, a very big part of Missouri's Civil War history. It really was. And then there's the Civil War Cemetery there as well which uh, you'll be able to tour as well. And uh, there's gonna be food and refreshments and all kinds of things going on. So um, um, again, tickets are selling pretty steadily. And so you may want to get your tickets now to ensure you have space, uh, paranormalsciencelab.com for that. And then um, on November 19th, we have two events. Um, we will be, uh, at always buying boats in the afternoon for boat signing yes proving that we actually have boats that we ride yeah. yes um, <laughs> so come out and talk to us uh and then that night we will be at the web city public library for uh his haunted history tour and paranormal investigation yes so, um, and it is a very haunted uh, uh site with decades of poltergeist activity uh full body apparitions, et cetera, that um, uh, we've had uh, quite a bit happen on tours in the past. So it's it's always a good event. So get your tickets at paranormalsciencelab.com. Very excited. And that is a full autumn season of, uh, it is. <laughs> of hauntings. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, we may not get much sleep. Uh, it's going to be good going to be really good now we can sleep in winter exactly oh on to our on to our topic uh, vampires and the ozarks 
Where do you want to start? Oh, well, I, I think it's, let's, let's do the same thing we did on YouTube. Let's kick this off a little bit with what is a vampire pop culture versus folklore. Okay. Well, I guess if we start with, with pop culture, I think that that's where people are, are starting from. That, that's where people's assumptions are because we are inundated with the motif. Um, we are. These days, it's everything from Twilight to various um, TV shows and books about vampires that really paint um, the motif as not necessarily a monster or a cautionary tale, but as a romance. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that, which, which uh, is a new twist in, in 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 the very long saga of vampirism. <laughs> and, and and I I think that it 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 bears important discussion in terms of the pop culture psyche because all of this also directly impacts how we perceive not only the word but also the contemporary and past lore that. Yeah we will be getting into in the in the ozarks um there is and and to to some degree i i think that certainly since mm, certainly since bram stoker and coleridge with mm -hmm. uh christabel yeah that there there has been certainly within the the victorian and and romantic era pre pre-victorian romantic era uh, of art that the idea of the vampire uh, has existed as a uh, as, as a metaphor for uh, various forms of eroticism yes um and really, that's the time that that's really the beginnings of, of this, um, the change uh, from being very much a monster to playing with the idea of eroticism and sexuality. Um, yeah. And in the Victorian age, particularly in, in Stoker, certainly uh, played on it, you know, that uh, that delicate line between taboo and preoccupation. Um, again, modern audiences often think that the Victorians were, were very prudish, very uptight and et cetera, which really was not the case. Uh, no. uh, actually preoccupied with uh, eroticism a lot more than we uh, think about. And, and there have been, you know, vampiric, um, uh, operas, et cetera, going on in Europe for a couple hundred years, uh, but really was not in quote mainstream um, consciousness. Um, and so you have a direct line from that Victorian Gothic uh, playing with uh, forbidden sin to then Anne Rice, um who again plays on those topics but she also delves into sort of the the psyche of of the vampire and i think that's what kind of defines her works is that you, you're talking about what you know what is the psyche of the creature itself and yes. the notions of of good and bad um and then um and perhaps and and i love i love interview with the vampire uh, and all, all of the uh, her books um which i've read and seen the movie a number of times etc but perhaps um this jump people often say how did we jump from that to twilight which of course was written as fan fiction originally but when uh, when you think about it Anne Rice wrote the you know vampire Lestat in which a bored you know 600 year old vampire decides to 
turn himself into a rock star. Yes. Um, and um, so per perhaps Anne started that leap <laughs> to glitter. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, I think it is, uh, I think it's fair to say that that trajectory, certainly the potential for that trajectory was created. Um, what I find, what I find uh, interesting out of, a, out of a couple of elements of that is, is first of all, uh, vampires are, I would say, easily the most well-known for folkloric horror creature uh, yeah. that we're, we're discussing, uh, that we have discussed. And the second, is that the uh, the, mm, the the vampire of Western culture uh, of or of European and uh, in the United States North American culture is in terms of its sensibility uh, the uh, mm, the, the gentility, the forbidden allure, uh, these are, are traits that are not part of vampiric creatures and black witches of Native American tradition. That's true. Um, and more ancient European tradition as well. Um, yes, uh, the, that we're, we're dealing with, uh, if we go over to more ancient tradition, or if we switch over to, for example, um, things like raven mockers in Cherokee lore, uh, these are the, these are not alluring creatures. They are quite terrifying and oftentimes very disgusting. Working on it, Josh. Okay.
Okay, let's try this again. <laughs> uh, phase two. I don't know. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> so we're okay. So where were we <laughs> before we were uh, interrupted? <laughs> um, uh, um. Oh, uh, pop culture implications, sort of the 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 the, the unconscious psychological baggage, and yeah. the allure and and rice. We're concluding yes. with and rice. Well, in in the ancient, uh, the more ancient views and and so on and so forth, um, I think that um, you know, and one thing that I've kind of mulled over is I wonder is if if this this current um, fascination with vampires and making it a very romantic kind of notion um, comes out of our fear or idea that all our monsters have gone away. They're yes. really not monsters anymore. That, and, and it is a way, it is a way of exploring and it, it is a, certainly a way of exploring uh taboos in a metaphorical sense yes and but i think as a consequence of what's happening is that the initial original idea of making a cautionary tale um is lost yes yes for, for by and large there's not a huge downside to a lot of these newer stories true the uh, the angst of being the undead is a lot less angsty than it used to be <laughs> the undead is just 15 year old <laughs> <laughs> We we've swerved violently into teenage poetry at this point. Um, <laughs> Not so, again. Not again. <laughs> it, it is fun to think about. Um, well, I, I think that mm, the 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 thing that, while still very alluring, the thing that makes Anne Rice's work, particularly with Lestat, interesting is the the depth of gravitas, the sense of of suffering that is associated with being a vampire. And then so that there is a, a yin and yang. There is the the benefit of of the of being a vampire, but then there's also the the, the devastation, the emotional devastation, or the spiritual devastation, the angst, the real angst that is associated with that. I, I yeah. think that as as succeeding layers of fan fiction have been built upon that, and then translated through popular culture, uh, the gravitas of of being the undead has been mostly sanded down, and so you're you're left with the uh, you're left with the glitter. Sparkly. Um, here, here's one thought that as, as, as we've explored this sort of individualism almost uh, of vampires and this introspection, they've suddenly, I think over time, became less the other as well. This is true. And you can identify with them, what they're yes. doing. And, and there is a bit of a, just from a literary sense, speaking as a, as a, as a fiction writer as well, there's a little bit of a danger. You, you familiarize yourself into the other enough, uh, there, there isn't much to be forbidden. It becomes rather mundane. Exactly. Um, you know, because, and, and I do think and, and Rice did that very well because you you could empathize with her monsters. Um, and then it's just kind of progressed on. But it's this 
this notion is so divorced from past notions that you don't even recognize it as the same thing. And for those who are wondering, why are we talking about this? And what does this have to do with the Ozarks? Stay tuned. <laughs> Exactly. There is a there is a phrase, a term, uh, word that you use that I think is very powerful. Um, it's a it's a word that we tend to steer away from uh, mm -hmm. a lot, and it is the word monster. Uh, I'm going to go yeah. back go yeah. back to uh, Rice's work for just a moment, and yeah. something that she's been very consistent about was very consistent yeah. about is that as lovable as her yeah. her characters were they were monstrous yes yes and perhaps that's you know that 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 is a a lesson in human behavior as well is that the monster can be very charismatic uh, but in the end it's still just as dangerous and i am and, and we are leading the point um not just fiction but uh is something that I think is in, in, in many terms we're in danger of losing in the narrative is the the monstrous nature because we're we're so ready um, so so very ready to jump to the idea that everything and everyone must be understood right that and of course, there are many social benefits to keeping an open mind. But one of the things that that does is it, um, from a, I think a very, uh, a point, a place of naivete drains out the potential of monstrousness within human beings, which we see on a regular basis. Yes, and, and even with some of the stories that are tied to this and those arts. Yes, which I think would be a very interesting place to jump in, actually, right off the bat of the okay. right off the top of the list, vampirism in Missouri, the November 23rd, 2016 Springfield, Missouri stabbing case. Yes. Um, the, and, and this is something that is pretty well um, twofold for me. It, it, it's emblemic of the current fictional status of pop culture vampires and yes. then also something that uh, some people may not be as familiar with but uh particularly about the 1990s and early 2000s vampire culture um across the united states um people may be rather surprised that there were a number of uh Covens, cults, whatever you'd want to say, that practiced some form of blood sharing and yes. uh, vampirism uh, with very stylized uh, lifestyles, et cetera, and some with rituals, et cetera. Um, and that seemed to kind of die down a little bit, but this incident just kind of jumps out of both of those two factors it seems <laughs> it does it does and uh, and i think really showcases uh, that culture going off the rails yes um i mean and certainly there, there's a number of of different lifestyles and different um uh, let's just say fetishes uh, that happen um that it's like okay whatever that's what someone's interested in but vamp vampirism is something that can go exceedingly wrong and spiral out of control um yes I mean, now in this and interesting enough this is a springfield missouri case do mm -hmm. you do you want to detail uh what actually took place oh i mean we can a little bit we don't have to mention names or anything i mean it's it, it was public uh, information but um basically a couple experimenting yes uh a, a young woman actually a 19 year old at the time 
um, allowing her boyfriend to cut her arm and drink her blood. There was an argument ensued, this uh, transition to slapping, this transition to yelling. And then uh, the girl stabbed her boyfriend multiple times, including in the lung. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then uh, used his blood to write a heart and I love you on the wall and then ultimately called 911. And in and, and that scene it just kind of takes a lot of those elements out of everything we just talked about from some of the fictional current fictional trends. Um, it, does. it does. Full of, full of contradictions, let's just say. <laughs> It, it is, and it's it's obviously it's not something that would be funny if you were there, and certainly not funny if you walked in on that scene. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, the the man uh, who was wounded uh, insisted throughout the entire process that his wounds were self inflicted, and uh, the the nineteen year old was charged with first degree domestic assault and armed criminal actions. Mm -hmm. So Twilight very much gone wrong in this particular yes. case. Yes. And, but it also points out something, and I think this is probably the, the next point to, to jump into. Uh, well, let me, let me just kick off with this quote. I, I found really interesting uh, at the time. Let me see here. The page is over. This is a long way from the stakini. Um, that uh, uh, actually from a from a uh, first historian in Cosmopolitan saying mm -hmm. that uh, public fascination, this pretty much mm, just repeats what you already said. Um, but public fascination with vampires is nothing new, but in the 1990s, Vampires enjoyed a revival spurred in part by the success of Bram Stoker's Dracula, 1992, and Interview with a Vampire, 1994. By the time Jennifer Wolfe examined the vampire subculture in New York City, vampirism could be found in cities across the country. Cosplay, sex, blood drinking, and occasionally deeds far darker well, are, were all part of Cosmo's investigation of the eerie erotic world of real life vampires. So. I, I think, first of all, I think it's, it is very interesting. There are, there is a subculture of quote unquote, real life vampires, individuals who engage in uh, ritualistic fetish and role play of inspired by uh, pop culture and sometimes more ritualistic lore associated with vampires. And so there, there, I think that, that it's fair to say that within this culture, there is a, a gradient or a gamut ranging um, from cosplay, which mm -hmm. is, is I, I don't cosplay as a vampire, but I do cosplay, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to uh, some really dark uh, ritualistic practices. Yes, and, and, and in fact, in the 90s, there, there, was, a, there was a journalist who was, um, and I, her name escapes me uh, at the moment, she was investigating uh, the vampire culture in New York City, and she disappeared, and they mm. never found her, um, as, as far as I ever knew. Um, so it could, it could get very dangerous, and what um, actually a lot of people may be surprised that um, there were several sort of centers of this culture, New York City being one, New Orleans being another, and surprisingly, for a lot of people, Springfield, Missouri being, being one. Yes, and I think that would be a really interesting place to, to go to next. Uh, local, uh, particularly uh, local Southwest Missourians, who have an interest in the, the esoteric and the visceral are already familiar with the vampire tunnels, quote unquote, yeah. of Springfield, Missouri. And, and I will say that that actually, you know, that that, uh, that uh, lore, that, that culture group predates the 1990s in Springfield. Um, uh, I know it, it was, 
going strong in the in the 1980s and, and actually there are some stories of of vampire culture uh, in Springfield going back to the 1890s interesting I you know, to, I want uh, to dig into that there was a there was a reference in our in our notes um that I, I found I found just interesting in its yin yang qualities. Uh, this was from a, a, a 2005 Springfield uh, News Leader article uh, about the Springfield tunnels. And there's some very interesting details in that. Uh, but there, there was a quote. Um, this is, was, I, I take that back, 2014. Uh, but the quote from this uh, 2014 article says, if you believe a 2007 news leader story, which I don't, there was a group of young vampires hanging out of these catacombs under the Queen City back then. And uh, the Springfield Tunnels article, which is online, takes a very tongue-in-cheek approach mm -hmm. to uh, really every aspect of the Springfield Tunnels. And, and, you know, that, that's one, and, and this is something I wanted to talk about specifically because, uh, and we've seen this with different stories, whether real or urban legend in the Ozarks of, of uh, certain stories, uh, real events or real phenomena kind of being lost and people starting to think that it was made up just like this. We've seen that yes. with the like we've seen that actually with Billy Cook, that Billy Cook really did not exist. He was not a serial killer. He, it was just a story. Um, uh, and the thing of it is, is from, you know, I've had contact, lived in Springfield off and on for years. And the, vamp the tunnels and the vampire culture was well known when I was in college. Um, and it continued um, when I practiced law there, if, you know, things came up. Um, I, I know from people younger than me who had personal experiences uh, exploring the tunnels um, yeah. in, in the early, you know, 2010s. Um, so this is something that, you know, has gone on for decades. And I find it ironic in 2014. Oh, we don't believe this was happening in 20, you know, 2007. And I, I know personal accounts that yes, it was. Yes. Um, in in fact, in fact, people exploring and trying to document it and being chased, um, mm -hmm. stumbling upon uh, ritualistic uh, gatherings, and um, and then of course um, uh, to say that you know it, nothing ever happened it kind of divorces itself entirely then from the very real events of the Cheryl Feeney murder case. It does. And I I, I do find this particularly interesting. I'm gonna just addendum on this and then we'll move on to the Feeney case. That in so many cases, particularly in the in the Green County Springfield area, uh, we're we're oftentimes asked to talk about uh, urban legends, the albino farm being the most prominent, and in a situation in which we we are consistently having to burst people's bubble and say, guys, it's an urban legend. It yeah. It it really we don't have the kind of uh, of um, you know detail that it, it's not there it is it is something that folks made up but thanks for thanks for asking thanks for playing uh, the vampire culture of springfield as you have just detailed is something that on the surface uh instead of having urban an urban legend certainly there is there is what i would classify as chatter mm -hmm. Uh, about it and chatter making its way onto message boards and, and a variety of small articles. But the the larger narrative is to I, I feel is to to really uh, mirror 
quote was in this 2014 Newsleader article, which is very bland, really. It is saying, oh, we have an infrastructure of, uh, of storm drains. And they're basically saying there's nothing to see here. Move along, folks. There's, there's no lore. There's no legend. There's no history. Uh, perhaps there were some vagrants, some homeless people who lived down there. And perhaps someone uh, mistook something for something else. And it's, it's time to move on from this. There's nothing here to see. We have data, a lot of data, uh, that says something very different. Yes. Um, um, and yeah, I, I do find that interesting that sometimes, you know, where, there is, where there's fire, you know, people say, oh, that's an urban legend. And where there's nothing, they think it's true. Um, and, and the uh, albino farm versus this is a good example. Um, and, and perhaps, you know, um, th there seems to be a, um, per a, uh, ongoing thread that comes up whenever we talk about underground spaces that yeah. people have a hard time believing that there are these underground spaces. Um, we just had the post on the page about tunnels under Joplin and we we've already had comments about really there were tunnels you know um which I mean it's very very well documented and uh for some reason there's this disconnect and and yes the the tunnels now are, are quote storm shell uh, storm runoff uh tunnels but they originally were Jordan Creek um yes. most of it has been covered over with asphalt and concrete and um there are lots of places to to hide and gather uh particularly if you don't want to be seen uh as long as you're not in the middle of a rainstorm <laughs> <laughs> and uh i think that um that's what people again don't want to uh don't want to don't want to think about that there that, that there could be something really dark it goes back to is there really a monster and if the monster's human that's even worse that you know because it might be it might be us in a situation you know um and so you play into oh it has to just be nothing um you you end up there um but it's funny, 2014, so we're, we're talking, we're talking 18 years after the Feeney case. Yes. Which in some ways is not very long, but then again, it is quite a long time in, in the minds of particularly younger people who are interested in these subjects. True. So... I want to I want to insert one thing very very quickly. One of the things that we're, we're consistently talking about is human beings um, practicing ri ritualistic vampirism. Mm -hmm. um, that does seem to be what we're what we're talking about. Um, now I do think that there is certainly the potential uh, in some of these uh, almost Lovecraftian style uh, rituals involved that under uh, certain circumstances, comparatively rare circumstances, uh, you might be able to call yourself up an apex predator of, uh, of a supernatural variety. Well, you, you, you potentially could. And even if not a supernatural variety, just an apex predator of a human variety as well. It, it certainly has the, the, the hallmarks of attracting sociopathic tendency individuals yes and uh, um you know so that's sort of the background and the um the feeny case is still unsolved technically yes. um and uh just a synopsis there's there's plenty of information out there for anyone who wants more details i remember very clearly i was living in springfield and and uh practicing law there um when it happened, uh, Cheryl Feeney and her two children were murdered in their home while her husband was, who was a teacher, uh, was at a conference um, at Lake of the Ozarks. Um, 
And very quickly, he became the main suspect and was charged in the murders. Uh, in the course of all this, it ended up that um, uh, coming out that he was involved in the Springfield vampire community. Um, some people discounted that. Some people took it to heart. Um, and um, ultimately, uh, so some of the evidence at the crime scene would indicate uh, more of a ritualistic nature of the murders um marks on the neck certain things written in blood etc um and uh, ultimately after a very in-depth long trial um you know he was not found guilty although the jury later was polled and i'm gonna be very candid the jury was polled and every single juror believed he was guilty but that there was not enough physical evidence to convict him. Mm. So, um, you know, on one hand, you can say, as an attorney, you know, uh, on one hand, you can say, well, the jury didn't just become inflamed by their passions that they believed he was guilty and just convicted him uh, completely on circumstantial evidence. Um, on the other hand, they were, you know, to the last juror convinced that he was guilty. So in the end. Interesting. That now in, you know, regardless of, of uh, ultimately how people feel about that you know, and parsing that out, that verdict really flies in the face of the hysterical townspeople looking for vigilante justice which is actually a rather positive reality it, it is i mean it's it's one of those and, and to be perfectly honest in, in at the moment it was kind of surprising because there, there was it, it was a very emotionally heightened case um and a lot of people were kind of surprised that of the acquittal uh, because of that that mentality, that, that energy in the air, almost like you said, uh, pitchforks and flames almost. Um, and, uh, but I can tell you, and, and this, and this is in, in published as well um, in some of the sources that we reviewed, um, defense counsel, it, 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 it affected Sean and he left the practice of law for a number of years afterwards and, mm -hmm. and uh, actually became a candy maker quite successfully. Um, yeah. But, um, and, and um, just from things I know, it, 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 it took an emotional toll on a lot of people who were involved in the case. Um, now, I, you know, it's, it's um, interesting points. I'm just going off the notes that I have. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, some of the some of the uh, loose connections uh, implied certainly by my notes that were loose. Um, that that uh, the suspect. Uh, played a game called vampires of the masquerade mm -hmm. that um the prosecutor said that he took the vampire tank game to the extreme uh and then used it to assume the role of a killer and wiped out his family but then other other references um say for example i've never seen the vampire of the masquerade players in the tunnels but i've seen the city square they aren't a cult they are harmless. It's called LARPing, live action plural play. It's like drama club for the kids even geekier than the ones in drama club. Um, you know, that that sort of thing to really just is, is imply that uh, the vampiric connection is imagined. The idea of that, you know, and so I'm, I'm and I'm I'm unaffiliated, obviously, with this one way or the other. Um, right. 
but the the idea that say uh, there's a crime occurs and then we find out that uh, one of the suspects plays Magic the Gathering, so we assume that he's a wizard. That sort of thing. Right. Right. Um, and 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 there seem to be more more to it than just that, as far as some some of the testimony um, as to the depth of his involvement, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah. In the end, there there wasn't enough physical evidence to to for the jury to convict, even though they believed he was responsible. Um, mm -hmm. And so that in itself, as you said, is, is quite interesting. Um, and basically, it, it's a it's a case that's just kind of lingered out there, a cold case. No other suspects have ever been identified. Um, and so the, sort of the notion of these ties just kind of, I think, faded in a lot of people's memory. Um, but what I think more than anything, it highlights that the culture was going on and, you know, maybe it was just LARPing. Maybe it was just game, you know, a card game. Could there have been someone, whether, and I'm not saying Feeney or it could be someone else, could someone have used that environment for a darker purpose? Well, that yes. happens all the time. And there are other serial killers that have uh, taken on sort of a vampire king sort of motif as yes. well over time. So um, there was one down in Florida back in the 70s, and I can't remember who, uh, I can't remember his name now. Um, and um, so those are always possibilities. But to just say, oh, none of this ever happened, you know, as far as the vampire culture, I think is a little naive. You're correct. And I think that's, I think that's a, it's an important balance to to essentially walk between the two the two viewpoints or the two paths yeah the yeah. uh you know and it is there there are there are elements even in just the the surface documentation that regardless of of not 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 arriving at any specific conclusion as to who you know actually committed these crimes that there were dark elements associated all the way around Yes, yes, um, and uh, and I think it's one of those things that perhaps that 2014 article uh, kind of indirectly points to that you know, we don't want to acknowledge that anything like this could be in our midst. Mm -hmm. It is. It is uncomfortable. It's something that. Uh... I think is is an interesting tightrope to walk is the the monstrous othering as opposed to the self monster. Exactly, exactly. It's it's very uncomfortable to arrive at the conclusion that the the horrific could be staring back at us in the mirror. Exactly, and I and I do think that is a recurring theme uh, with vampire lore through time. However, the vampire is dressed and packaged. Yes, it, it is. And, and sometimes speaking to an othering and sometimes speaking to a self, um, what, is, what is interesting is that when, when you have, have so erased the the monstrous from the other and then embrace what is in essence a a folklorically monstrous um persona mm -hmm. but done so somewhat if not wholly blithe to the reality of one's own darkness exactly 
is there's some 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 difficult things there was there was an interesting this was actually a religion news blog.com um i believe article uh about a uh a young woman in attending Drury University mm-hmm. who was approached by a um, a vampire coven and again we need to note these are not vampire vampires these are individuals who are embracing the the concept of vampires yes um and uh basically um pulled her into this coven and uh, she uh, fully embraced it to the mm, uh, detriment of a variety of things and apparently including her grades. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I, th- I, th- I think it's, you know, again, sort of that thrill of, of taboo and uh, acceptance by a group for not being completely conformist can be very seductive. And of course, again, it kind of goes back to that idea of, you know, seduction in one way or another often comes up in, in, in the lore. It does. And, and I think that, uh, you know, sort of the mm, counter argument that, that can be effectively made um, modern materialistic society is largely devoid of the esoteric uh devoid of the the magical and we interestingly enough even with the trappings of cultural religion there there is a uh highly materialistic highly consumer driven and very mundane everyone fits in a cubicle Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone needs to check off the right boxes in order to get ahead. Everyone needs to conform in order to, uh, you know, apply for the uh, uh, the nice life with the nice house in the nice neighborhood and the 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 constrictive, the emotionally constrictive um, burden and, and sociological burden that comes along with the word nice. We're all just have to be nice. And, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, <laughs> sometimes we don't want to be nice. And especially, and, and I think that there, there's a particular, in terms of vampiric cult ritual, there's a particular uh, allure for uh, adolescents in, in the sense that they they've been forced to conform for so much of their lives and it is a juncture point at which you're you're simply staring at additional conformity in the form of uh good grades and good schools and good choices and uh i think (laughs) yes and and some of that can be um difficult and incredibly suffocating the the girl in the uh uh, the the related to Drury article um, was uh, was a hyper intelligent child prodigy who was starting college at age fifteen. That 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 may explain why she got pulled in. Was, yes, <laughs> and and certainly the the potential for for that allure. Um, but the other side of that is as understandable as it may be to rebel against a society in which uh, there's a high compulsion to place everyone in a, in a bland, comfortable box that, uh, the, the, you know, gives you the screaming memes by age 45. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> I, I say this as one on the outside because I never went in the box. Uh, <laughs> But <laughs> there, there, you, you mean there is a box? <laughs> what box? <laughs> um, the boxes <laughs> must realize there is no spoon. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> um, but along with that is that the the 
as, as understandable as that allure is, there is no guarantee that the, uh, you know, however you want to cut it, the potential coven awaiting you uh, has, uh, first of all, has their head screwed on properly. And second of all, has the, uh, uh, the new initiate's best interest at heart. Exactly. Exactly. And which, of course, is not unique just to this situation. It, it happens in mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, that's why it's called hazing. Um, yeah. Yes, but, um, that's, I mean, that's very, very true. Um, but, um, oh, I want to jump gears just a little bit and talk uh, because people may be thinking, oh, this is just, you know, the only vampire connection with the Ozarks just is this more recent stuff that comes out of pop culture and all of this. Yes. Um, but um, there is a very interesting um, older account of the Elvins uh, vampire, potentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, up in uh, St. Francois County, um, mm -hmm. and um, early 1900s, if I recall. Yes, turn of the and, century. Yeah, um, which I, I find kind of, un, kind of unusual because, of course, the, the, there was a surge of um, vampire scares uh, in New England in the early 1800s. Yes. Um, which the sociological reasons for that, you know, they're, they're still trying to figure out why that happened. But then, you know, this is a hundred years later. They've uh, run out of witches. They run out of witches. <laughs> Very true. Um, and, you know, this is mining country, uh, pretty rural. Um, and, uh, now, and, and we do have to throw in that, and uh, you know, albino comes into play too, which is one of our our, our favorite foils uh, for urban legends. Is that you know there has to be an axe or an albino one or both. <laughs> Sadly, in this case, we do have an albino, but he did not have a farm. <laughs> it's true; he didn't have a farm. <laughs> no, I don't think he had an axe, so, although he might have had a, a miner's pick. <laughs> Um, but it's associated with Gibson Cemetery. Um, yes. The grave that, and it, it's kind of interesting because usually, you know, when you're reading these cemetery tales of, of something odd like this, it's a witch's grave. You know, there, um, if every witch, if there was a witch for every witch's grave tale, um, there would have been an awful lot, lot of witches. Witches. Um, but this is uh, a vampire grave. It is. It is. And, and, <clears throat> no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I, I finished my thought. Oh, it, it's, you know, the, the Elvins vampire grave, uh, Elvins, Missouri, which was uh, reincorporated with a number of small town in the immediate area, now Park Hills, Missouri, and St. Francois Mining, uh, St. Francois County. Uh, not very far from Farmington. Uh, so very interesting lore throughout the, of course, we're not very far from the Piedmont, uh, right. not very far from Leeper. Uh, lots of lots of Civil War uh, history there in the eastern Ozarks, south of St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And the, the, mm, the, the folkloric aspect of it, there's definitely... So I think yin and yang is a very, very uh, opposing, opposing forces, certainly within the, the folklore mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, a, interestingly enough, a, a, a Eastern European immigrant, uh, mm -hmm. a Hungarian man who apparently was an albino. Yes. Uh, who worked as a miner. He really, really was an albino in this instance. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm, I'm 
at this juncture, I'm assuming that he was not the inspiration for Minor 49er in uh, Scooby-Doo, 1969. <laughs> uh, classic original Scooby-Doo. <laughs> the... Although there was an albino in, in the Ozark Witch episode. Interesting. He, he, Interesting. He, he pushed the canoe, he pushed the, well, the flat boat through the swamp. <laughs> I, <laughs> I really need to revisit this episode. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, you you so, will not recognize the Ozarks in it, but. Fair. <laughs> but there is, is an albino, uh, basically, Pullman on yes. the boat. So, you know, you, you take, your, you take your, your, your intersections with reality where you can get them. And. <laughs> basically uh he is described as cruel or evil mm -hmm. and there are a number of mysterious childhood deaths that mm -hmm. take place and then the towns be and then uh the 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 miner doesn't go out during the day he is only out and about during the night and then the townspeople rise up and murder him and then there are no more mysterious childhood deaths so simple problem simple solution so, there, so in this case we really do have the village mob with the pitchforks and at forks. least according to the legend and yeah. now um and then they they bury him in um in the gibson cemetery mm -hmm. and i find this interesting there, there's there's a couple of somewhat um opposing references online one say that they buried him surrounded by the graves of the children who had died uh another one says that simply that there are a number perhaps a, a per capita concerning number of uh childhood ch children's graves within the cemetery the cemetery has a lead apparently um over 300 graves in it, which is pretty substantial for a rural, small rural cemetery. Right. And so uh, the the surrounded by seems a little bit of uh, perhaps a push. I haven't actually been to go look and document. Me either. So I don't know. I can't. I don't know the layout of the graves. Now another interesting little tidbit is right in Park Hills as well there is a smallpox cemetery mm. um, which is called the smallpox cemetery that's what it's even called um, from smallpox uh, epidemics including up into the early 1900s so to be perfectly honest my guess is a lot of these child deaths were probably related to smallpox or other epidemics yes now the and i think that it's it's very interesting to approach this this entire situation from very open mind entertaining highly opposing conclusions i do too uh, the and and uh, you know i'm going to reference the uh, the cemetery in newtonia there's a okay. there's a handful of uh of uh, graves in newtonia which have uh the the wrought iron fence enclosures mm -hmm. And that uh, I think there's, there's a variety of things that those enclosures denote, um, the, the least of which during the time of their construction was it's going to keep them in. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, um, of course, there's various lore about different substances, you know, that you know un unclean spirits or you know abominations can't cross this or that mm -hmm. uh, and uh and and actually some some of that actually does come out of that there there in certain places became tradition to cover uh graves with a almost a cage out of iron uh, wrought iron usually um, to deter grave robbers. Yes. So you know um, there there can be various assumptions or conclusions to be made. Very very true. Now 
there is a uh, a fenced uh, grave apparently mm-hmm. at Gibson Cemetery, and the, the the presumption is that it is the the Hungarian minor vampire, and it is the vampire's grave. The if if I recall correctly, there's a there is a stone in. I think so. I um, think so. Which seems uh, a, a little bit of an extra effort for for someone who was allegedly m- murdered for for killing the children. Unless the either a stone or to you know again. Sometimes, you know, sometimes um, society will put the sign up to, you know, to point to, you know, don't be like that, don't do that. Just mm-hmm. kind of in the same vein of when they, you know, we used to go out and have picnics and watch hangings on public hey, screens, yes. you know. This is true. Um, you know, you know historical only marker years is, ago. <laughs> historical marker is historical marker, regardless. Um, and, and then they, the now the, the the other side of this is, is of course it's very easy to jump to the conclusion that uh, uh, the 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 people of Elvins were uh, paranoid, backwards, and xenophobic, mm-hmm. and so you know something bad was happening to the kids, completely unrelated to this poor guy, and then he's he's the one who pays for it. Now. And vampirism aside, uh, simply because one is from, you know, uh, some, simply because one is a Hungarian minor and simply because one is an albino, uh, does not somehow magically um, preclude one from the capacity to do bad things. That, that's true, you know, but it is rather interesting that the 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 legend is vampire versus you know he just you know the the stock um, he's out there with with a hatchet or something just killing people. Um, yeah. The, the 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 summer caretaker version of urban <laughs> legends you know that you get so often is that you know just out killing kids at summer camp or whatever. Um, you know so whether it's because he was Hungarian or the albinoism or um, something made people come up with vampire though. It did. Now I'm gonna play devil's advocate again on this. And let's say something darkly mischievous was afoot. Mm -hmm. Uh, The implication is the children were dying but were dying in mysterious ways. Right. Uh, which would, would imply that there was not a, a way to trace the deaths back to a suspect. True, or, you know, sometimes, you know, um, unusual bleeding or something, you know, or during decomposition, you know, particularly. Uh, yes. If there was a delay, you know, in, in those days, if there was a delay in, in burial, sometimes just the natural processes uh, that the body goes through often would lead to accusations of vampirism um, yeah you know blood cooling around the mouth um, uh, gums receding so it looks you know uh, if you're looking at someone as a vampire they have fangs and things like this but it could be construed on you know bodies that they were a victim as well. Yes. Now, and then, and, and, and I think that there, there's the capacity to look at it two different ways uh, simultaneously. One being that uh, individuals experiencing severe grief um, simply, you know, beginning to engage in this sort of block think yeah. that something's wrong, something's wrong, looking for an explanation um, individuals can become very irrational uh, mm-hmm. during the grief process for a variety of, of reasons. This is very well documented. And, uh, and looking for this led to the, the Salem witch trials. Yes, uh, looking for not just a scapegoat. I think it's important to understand that in some of these situations, it's not simply looking for a scapegoat. It's looking for meaning, 
the idea that that death is not simply Random. capricious, meaningless. There had to have been a reason. Uh, there had to have been a purpose. Right. And perhaps that purpose was nefarious, at which point then justice needs to be served. Very true. Uh, these, are, these are parts of the human psyche. Now, the other side, the, the flip to that is that in so many cases, particularly in mountain culture, but not limited to mountain culture, death was not an anomaly. And these were individuals who were accustomed to seeing death. They were accustomed to, to, uh, uh, to infant and childhood mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these were not strangers to tragedy uh, simply because of the era and the, the region. And so there is the possibility that with this certain series of deaths, that there was a pattern being recognized that was somehow genuinely different. That's, and, and that's entirely possible, you know, that, that really is. We, we may want to jump over now to our, uh, talk a little bit about indigenous uh, lore. In the yes, I think that would be a great place to, uh, to conclude on this. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm very excited and, and rather fascinated uh, by this. Of course, we are going to, you know, the, there's, there's elements that definitely touch on, uh, on Cherokee witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And then you found uh, a, you found a new monster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 the Seminole um, owl man the stakini yeah and um and of course the seminoles they originally were in florida but they were relocated uh, many of them to uh oklahoma and clean areas that are you know in the ozarks um and certainly uh it seems that uh, their lore on this may have affected other tribes in the area as well yes uh, and this vampiric creature has a entirely different sort of uh, origin story than a uh, European idea of vampirism being, you know, sort of, you know, the undead being made by another undead. Um, it comes out of witchcraft and witches basically uh using black magic and uh, ultimately the sort of the the cost the karmic cost is you become this vampiric almost wraith thing yes and it is a it's it's pretty terrifying actually yeah <laughs> uh it is pretty ridiculously terrifying um more terrifying than a lot of better known um uh, in individuals they they appear to be uh consistently female yes and it is it is uh to me interesting it, it seems to be isolated to uh female seminal witches who within other um power structures don't have uh, authority right sort of that solitary practitioner in, in but that that said the the at least one of the references uh refers to the stakini in plural yeah uh and they uh uh this uh during the the florida seminole war a reference in 1835 uh, women, uh, Seminoles refusing to uh, be moved by uh, uh, federal troops and uh, then cursing the troops. And then uh, the, the morning after the, the curse, uh, a young soldier is found dead in his bed and an investigation concluded that the man's heart had been removed. That, that'll do it. It will. Um, <laughs> And uh, 
then a soldier uh, named Joseph Sprague abandoned his post. Essentially, the the, the whole company gets the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. Uh, as a uh, missing heart is uh, you know capable of doing. Um, <laughs> Sprague uh, abandons his post, flees through the forest at dusk, and quote he sees a group of Seminole women who had cursed the soldiers, and he watches in horror as they kneel, chant, expel their internal organs from their mouths, and one by one take on the form of owls and fly off into the night. That, that again, that would be enough to make me want to run off the post, you yeah. That, uh, and then according to the story, Sprague hurries back to Fort Brook um, and, and ultimately finds 109 of his fellow soldiers, the rest of the post, uh, dead in their beds with their hearts removed. It's brutal. Yes, it is. Um, the, the suggestion uh, or the, the reference, in, and I do find this interesting, the, the, according to this reference, which is uh, from Tripping on Legends, um, the, the myth or the mythology surrounding the Dade Massacre, that uh, the Stakini call upon a goddess named She Who Walks the Circle. And uh, it began that, that this goddess originally began as a mortal, uh, but abused her powers and became a cursed deity. Mm -hmm. And I also find it, it interesting that there's, there's certainly a, a, an almost cross-reference to harpies mm -hmm. in this. There are other um, uh, legends that, that have similar tones that uh but one of the things that actually jumps to mind and and for people who if you didn't catch it uh the stikini vomit out their internal organs onto the ground before turning into owls and then when they come back to their innards uh they eat them and then mm -hmm. transform back into into humans a, a little different transformation than werewolves it is and the uh the idea that their internal organs they hide somewhere mm -hmm. now there is a to me there's a, a unique reference there to selkies selkies coming out on land hiding their seal skins that's true i hadn't thought about that that's that that is true and it, it is interesting that you know that uh, it's um this the, the deity is sort of akin to being undead but was once human was once human and the um the the other thing that it, to me is striking and this is more on a corporeal realm but uh owls uh ingest their prey hole and then vomit them back up for their children or their 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 hatchlings Yes, that that is true. That is true. So I can see, you know, if 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 the creatures doing this, the comparison with owls, even if they were not literally changing, um, and you know, um, there is in Oklahoma uh, just lore with a lot of the native tribes about owls particularly seen during the day that it's bad luck if you see an owl during the day yes. um, which makes you wonder if it kind of goes back to this this lore it it does i i something i i'm consistently intrigued by uh that the, it, it's it's uh textural interpretation of supernatural beings in mm -hmm. in native american lore that i really like in the sense that it is so ridiculously confusing for somebody like me who's you know of european settlement descent uh, that, that it is you know even and, and i would i would say that uh you know 
1500 years of uh, dogmatic European Catholicism certainly has, uh, you know, it's, it's talons into the, into the psyche and that the Catholicism certainly uh, in, you know, having been inherit, you know, having inherited a lot of the, the, the structure and cubes and grids of the Roman Empire, the idea that everything fits into a, a pre-specified box. <laughs> with uh, with uh, you know post Renaissance or you know early modern era post Renaissance to post Renaissance creatures of European folklore, so almost everything got at least domesticated enough to stick inside a box. True, that's a good way of putting that. Uh, and, and and Native American lore does not, and so you're you're presented with this dizzying array of things which do not fit in boxes and exactly or at least the same boxes <laughs> yes um and, and that's you know it's in you know dealing with for example cherokee witchcraft is it's okay to kill a witch because a witch is a human being but right. a witch looks like a human being and i had an aunt once who was a witch uh and she's dead and we're going to go visit a grave, but nobody else wants to visit a grave. I am referencing a book, guys. I'm not just going off the seat of my gas. Um, a, a very excellent anthropological work. Um, but the idea that, but if you if you killed a witch, um, you didn't kill a human being, but they look like a human being. They act like a human being. And I talked to one and it was a human being. But when it's a witch, it's not. Yeah. And a European mindset says, well, pick one. And a, a more traditional, um, and I think realistically, a more sophisticated uh, mindset says, no, I don't have to because they don't either. Exactly. And, and if you go back further in time in European traditions, there was more of that mindset. Yes. Um, I, I, to me, a, a, a really powerful turning point probably a sad turning point in which the, uh, uh, the great folkloric beasts and beings of, uh, of Europe got placed in a zoo is the, the a mid 19th century publication of a compendium of, of fairies in which uh, all of your documentable Norse, Germanic, Irish, Anglo-Saxon, um, and Celtic um, fairies, essentially. Is it, a, is it a pixie? Is it a, is it a, is it a fairy? Is it an elf? Is it a goblin? Is it a sprite? Is it a brownie? Is it a dwarf? Is it a troll? Um, suddenly all got categorized in this highly modern um, mid 19th century tome that really reflects the, um, you know, 50 years approximately after unification of Great Britain, and we are the empire, uh, and even our uh, even our fairies have to conform within their proper cubicle boxes, and <laughs> you you just have this um, this sense that everything has to fit. Of course, that had been you know going on for quite some time, and, and I think you you might even argue that uh, things like the um, oh. The, the Latin term escapes me, but you have the book, the Maleficarum. I'm going to get it wrong. Oh, Mel, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm too tired to. Yes, yes, the uh, uh, the the the, um, the Holy Dark Roman Christ. Empire's book on how to hunt witches. Yes, uh, creating this now within the mindset there is a structure uh, in, in which to place things. Yeah. And, they're they're yeah. this and they're that <laughs> and oh one of the one of the mild less milder dark sides of reconquista but uh, it's very good <laughs> and I, I think it's but i think it's very powerful and it for to, to be able to sort of begin the process of resetting our expectation and something that when individuals do experience for example, the paranormal or the the esoteric or the weird, simply that they're they're having an experience that 
it, it's particularly unsettling because it doesn't fit in the box. True, very true. And, and this, you know, this certainly, this certainly happens with these kind of creatures in indigenous lore. Um, and, you know, just sitting here thinking, it makes me think that, you know, we, we think of a vampire of drinking blood, you know, even the, you know, the fangs in the neck or whatever, or, or whatever, but, and, and that's brutal, but, you know, ripping out the heart and ostensibly ingesting it. Um, yes. That's a little more brutal. It, it is. And regardless, I, I don't know if I like the idea. So in, in the hypothetical sense, I like the idea of this tikini because it's, it's exciting, it's esoteric, it's devastating. Uh, I like the idea of things that we don't understand going bump in the night. So let's just respect those things. On the yeah. other hand, if this tikini was after me, all of a sudden I'd be like, whoa, time out. You need to be mythical. Yeah, that, that's very true. Please go turn into an owl. Yes. <laughs> turn but back into an owl. I, you know, it, it makes sense why, you know, okay, maybe you don't want to see an owl during the day. <laughs> it, it definitely, and especially I think growing up with those, uh, those motifs. Now, in the idea that, that based on our... Uh, perhaps childhood and growing up experiences, our, our idea of what initiates revulsion can really be shaped by that. You look at, uh, yeah. you know, the, you know, so for example, me growing up, I, I, I love owls. Um, I do too, though, I, yeah. I, I think they're incredibly beautiful, majestic creatures. I'm always excited when I get to see them. I enjoy hearing them. Um, I actually have a number of owl art inspire pieces around the house so on mm -hmm. and so forth and i just think that they're these majestic birds uh that are that are that are very cool there are of course many reports of people of a different heritage responding with fear or revulsion uh yeah. at the at the hearing of an owl would be the sighting of an owl particularly an owl out of place in the daylight that sort of thing right uh, just not i don't you know, I don't have that. Uh, however, I did grow up inert within a, a Judeo-Christian structure. And, uh, you know, I have a very immediate visceral response to almost any time that I see a snake. So there you go. <laughs> Throw that out there. <laughs> we can't, we can't escape what we were raised in. Huh? <laughs> I don't, at, at least, um, uh, it 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 exists as our subconscious reality it does it does affect things um but but again um uh maybe i'll take the european va vampire if i have to choose you know? <laughs> as long as they don't sparkle i'm good yeah same here <laughs> That might be a good place to, to end tonight. To uh, close up for tonight, we appreciate everyone. Please like, share, subscribe, and um, you know, share your comments, share your ideas, share your thoughts. If you've experienced a vampire, uh, you may be entitled to compensation, but not from us. <laughs> no, but we'd like to hear the story. <laughs> yes, we would. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone have a good week, and we'll be back next Wednesday. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.